Okay, welcome back. We're going to do another lab together, and this lab is all about making an unknown carboxylic acid. So before you start this virtual lab experience with me, you need to be ve very, very familiar with the carbonyl world. If you're not familiar with the carbonyl world, folks, forget it, hang it up. You're not going to do very well in this at all. So you need to go and you need to watch those lecture videos that's all about the top one carbonyl and the top two carbonyl. That's very, very important. So the top one and the top two carbonyls, we're not going to focus on all of them here. And I need you to kind of keep in mind, remember, top two carbonyls, there are two of them, and that's typically your ketones and your aldehydes. That's what we're going to find in that family of carbonyl groups. We're not focused on top one or top two here. We're focused on top one. And within top one, we are going to be focused on carboxylic acids with this particular lab experiment together. So a carboxylic acid is, of course, this carbon double bond O with an OH group that happens in a molecule. And uh, we've talked about how to name them. We've talked about the reactions that can come along with them. We've said, look, there's an acyl group, which is a C double bond O. And there's also an OH group, which is kind of like an alcohol. So we've talked in extent a little bit about these carboxylic acids. And that's going to be very important. So you have to be able to understand those those basics before you really kind of get the gist of what's going on in this lab experiment that we're going to get ready to do with each other because you're my lab partner. All right, so uh, this particular experiment is going to be using a compound called malic anhydride. All right, so the structure of malic anhydride looks very similar to this. It is a cyclopentane ring, so there we go. However, one of these carbons is actually not going to be there. And instead, what we're going to have is an oxygen that is there in that position. So this is called a hetero heterogeneous ring or heterogeneous ring. Tomato, tomato, you know how I am. All right, so, and then off of this oxygen, we have a carbon that's here that has a double bond O. And we also have a carbon that's there that's a double bond O. And then we have a double bond that's located right here. All right, so I'm going to pick apart the structure a little bit because, number one, this says anhydride. And guess what, folks? Anhydrides are carbonyl compounds. And carbonyl compounds, we should have talked about at this moment. And these carbonyl compounds are also type 1. So we talked about anhydrides. We talked about the nomenclature of anhydrides. We talked about the structure. We talked about reactivity. And this is a anhydride. And you're looking at this and you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. This doesn't look like an anhydride to me. And I'm going to say, well, it is. And you need to be very careful because... Most of the time that we've seen an anhydride in the lecture portion of the course, it's always been an oxygen with a carbonyl to the left and a carbonyl to the right. And these could be any random alkyl groups to the left or to the right-hand side of me. So every time these anhydrides were in a straight chain, and it looks something like this again to the right-hand side here. Never really ever probably did we focus on a ring structure that's also using an anhydride. And folks, this is an anhydride because here is the oxygen in the middle, and that oxygen has a carbonyl to the left, and it has a carbonyl to the right. So that is an anhydride structure, and this this is why we call this malic anhydride, because it has an anhydride, and there's the structure. Uh, this also has a double bond. So here we also see a uh, alkene characteristic, and this is the molecule that we're going to be starting with in this particular virtual lab together. So we're going to do a reaction using this top one carbonyl family group, and it looks like, according to the name of the actual virtual lab, it seems like we're going to be making a carboxylic acid. So I'm going to take the anhydride structure, and I'm going to end up doing something to this using some type of reagent. 
and end up with some form of a carboxylic acid. And we're going to have to find out what kind of carboxylic acid that we actually have uh, produced in this reaction as a product. All right. So that is the overall concept of really what we are stepping forth and going on our journey together with. Uh, so what kind of carboxylic acid? And we're going to have to be able to pick that out from a huge table of possible unknowns based on the laboratory data that we generate. All right, so the question now is what on earth do we use in order to get this done? So the lab experiment is going to bring in really two reagents, and that is it. Uh, the first one is going to be zinc, and the next one is going to be hydrochloric acid. And that's it, folks. That's all that we're really actually doing here. So it looks to me like if we're not bringing any extra reagents on, then the question that we always have here is, are we increasing the number of carbons in this molecule? And the answer is no, we're not. We're not increasing uh, because it looks like the reagents that I'm picking up really don't have carbon involved in them at all. So if I have this structure of malic anhydride, and I'm just going to draw it a different way here. If I've got this structure that we're going to be doing something with, and I kind of mix in zinc and hydrochloric acid into the picture, we're not really increasing any carbons, it looks like, unless these two molecules can react together and give us even longer chain. Uh, but it also tells us we're going to make a carboxylic acid. So that means I'm going to have to figure out what on earth is going to cause this C double bond OH group to form. Well, let's be a little clever here. Here's my carbon double bond O with an oxygen right here. All right. So it looks like if I could just add on a hydrogen in some form or fashion on that ring system, I could maybe go there and break a bond and this ring system will actually open up for me and this creates my carbon double bond ooh onto one end of the molecule and then i've got like this weird little thing that's hanging off here this double bond o and then there's like nothing going off to it right now but quite honestly if i just look at what's actually here it looks like there's a possibility of some type of chloride maybe that gets added on or if I'm generating some H here, I'm also understanding that this hydrochloric acid's got some water with it too. So there's a possibility of maybe another OH coming in just due to the solvent that we have. So yeah, chlorine could maybe go on, a byproduct could form. There's not going to be a lot of that though compared to our solvent, which is just H2O. And if I can get this H, to kind of kick off and go to that point, then I have another OH that's left over, and maybe that one could go on this side. And we could actually form two carboxylic acid groups onto this molecule, and it will make it a di-carboxylic acid. All right. So that is the idea. We don't really know what's going to happen here, right? I mean, that's part of the laboratory data. That's part of what we're going to be generating result wise at the end of this and comparing that to a table. But at least I've got some options that I'm thinking about right now. So now the, the next step I want to go through before we go further is the concept of, well, why on earth are we picking zinc and hydrochloric acid? All right. So uh, as far as zinc goes, um, you need to understand that zinc is a metal, but zinc is also going to react with hydrochloric acid here. And that's really the point of why we're using it, because we want something to happen to the hydrochloric acid. We want this reaction to go forward very well, and zinc is almost going to act like a catalyst here. So what does it actually do? Well, okay, in uh, general chemistry, we had this thing called a single replacement reaction. And a single replacement reaction is there's a couple in the bar on a Friday or Saturday night, and someone single walks into the bar. And that hydrogen and that chlorine begin to have eyeballs, and they begin to look around in the bar to see who else is there. And chlorine goes, hubba, hubba, there's 
some zinc, and I think that's a little bit prettier than the hydrogen that I'm attached to now. So, hey, zinc, do you want to go out? We'll leave the bar tonight, and we'll go make a product, baby, if that's what you want to do. And zinc says, absolutely, sure, I'm on board, let's go. So, what we see is a single replacement. A single comes into the bar, nothing on it. Zinc is living, living the single bachelor or bachelorette life. And zinc will pair up with chloride. And chloride is a negative one charge. Zinc is typically a positive two charge. So this is actually going to end up being a ZnCl2. So that means it takes two molecules of the HCl in order for this to go forward. And what we end up with here is some H2. And that H2 is H2 gas. So that hydrogen gas is very flammable, and I have to be very careful in this virtual lab, right? I have to. You don't have to because you're in the safety of your own bedroom or your own room or your own house, or maybe you're on a plane or maybe you're on a cruise ship. Who knows? But you really don't have to go through risking your life in the name of organic like I have to. Oh, well, that's my job, though. So we're going to generate this hydrogen gas. This hydrogen gas is probably going to create some bubbles for us. Uh, and uh, this is a very good sign that we're leading this molecule up to be reactive. Because if I can take some of that hydrogen that's getting spit, 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 spit out of the HCl, and some of that hydrogen could go onto this malic hydride to initiate that reaction and to open up the ring a little bit better, then all of the other water that's also going to be present in the solvent uh, can actually do its job as well and free up the OH H's or free up the H's or free up the CL in order to get it to do its job. All right. So that's the whole purpose of why we're using the zinc in this reaction. It's to stimulate this relationship to go forward a little bit faster and get the malic and hydride to actually pop open uh, and uh, create these carboxylic acid structure groups for us. All right. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's kind of go through and take a look at these uh, reagents that you probably will need to know more information about. So here's our malic and hydride. Uh, Acros Organics is going to be the manufacturer of the malic and hydride. It looks like it's 99% pure. So looks pretty good to me. And then over here to the side, it's kind of cut out. Uh, but this very top number is the lot number that you might need at some point in time. So that's 364-940010. So there's malic and hydride. I'm also going to need hydrochloric acid. So here's our concentrated hydrochloric acid. We Again, we put it in really tiny jars here just to make it a little bit safer for you to pick up a smaller uh, container of hydrochloric versus our two and a half liter jugs of hydrochloric acid that's concentrate. And uh, from here, well, there's not really no label on it that we provide. So just like before in some of the other labs, we just call this stock because we really don't know where that came from. The laboratory should keep track of that and have a binder or a folder with more information about the acid that's inside of that bottle that we've used. Uh, next is zinc metal, so I'm going to have to use some zinc as well. Uh, zinc can come in different forms. Zinc can come in what we call mossy, which is just really kind of an ugly chunk of just random structured zinc. Uh, and then uh, here for this particular lab, we are using granular zinc, which takes that big chunk of zinc and just kind of grinds it up. Up, and you can see the small little flex that's inside of this bottle here. Uh, if we uh, grind it up um, really, really tiny, this increases our surface area. It also increases the amount of zinc that can react at any sort point in time. Uh, and we typically get a better reaction here. So this zinc is a 30 mesh granular here. Uh, that lot number is C11T023. And that company is Alpha Asar. All right, so I'm going to have to go to the um, lab directions, kind of read what it tells me to do. Uh, it tells me to weigh out a certain amount of malic and hydride, and I will. It's probably not going to tell me the number of grams, though, actually. It's going to tell me probably in terms of 
uh, millimolars of this and millimolars of that. So you can do those calculations on your end if you need to, uh, but here is the malic anhydride. And uh, that is a teared weigh boat. So I put the weigh boat on the scale, I hit tear, I made it read zero. So that is the mass of the malic anhydride on its own. So 2.690 is going to be the mass of the malic that we're going to be using. As far as the Malik, uh, this is a, a very kind of close-up, blurry picture, but nothing really special here with Malik and Hydride. Uh, these are very flat crystals. They're very shiny. Uh, you really probably can't tell that from that picture, uh, but they are that traditional, boring, white, shiny, crystalline product or reagent that we've often seen with many labs before. All right, so there's Malik and Hydride. I'm also going to have to weigh out some zinc, uh, so I'm going to pour some of that uh, mossy granular zinc, actually granular zinc, uh, onto a teared weigh boat again, and that uh, weigh boat was 0, 0.000 when I teared it, and I added the zinc directly to that weigh boat, and I ended up getting about 1.933 grams. Again, in the lab directions, they're going to tell you millimolars, and I've done a little bit of that math for you already, so you don't have to worry with it, but that is the uh, mass that we're using zinc of the moss or the granular zinc. So close-up of the granular zinc is a little bit better than the close-up of the malic. Uh, you can tell a little bit better about what this zinc looks like here. So uh, very uh, metallic-y. Uh, they're metal shards, basically. They're pretty sharp. Uh, I've got to be careful when I'm handling them. I don't want to puncture myself with them because it could bring blood if I'm not very careful. And the lab directions also tell me to measure out some water. So I did, this is deionized water from our laboratory uh, sprayers. And uh, you can kind of look at the graduated cylinder here and you can eyeball how much water that we've actually used in the lab experiment. Uh, so what that means is that I'm going to have to add these three things together. These three components should go into the same flask, uh, and that's the very first part of the lab experiment once I measure these out. Uh, so I just kind of want to sit back, and I'm personally going to shut up, and then I'm going to turn on a virtual of me and make that one talk for a little bit. Uh, and then you can watch these steps as they go forward. So keep in mind, take a look at the additions, make sure that you write down the observations. Anything that goes on is very important to include in a laboratory notebook. Uh, so a couple of videos here are going to be back to back. Just be patient uh, and we'll uh, play those little bit by little bit. All right, everyone, so we're doing the first part of the lab procedure, and it tells me to add my malic and hydride to about 15 mils of water. And uh, what you're going to see here in the video is the hot plate that I'm eventually going to use because it does say for me to heat it up until the malic and hydride begins to um, dissolve for me. Uh, so what you're seeing on the screen right now is me adding the malic and hydride, and there we go. So malic and hydride, just the typical what kind of crystal that you're always going to see probably in a laboratory, nothing special about it at all. And then I'm going to take the 15 mils of water that I actually measured out uh, using a graduated cylinder, volumes don't have to be exact here, and I'm going to add it to the malic and hydride. So as you can tell, um, that malic and hydride is actually not going to dissolve fully in the water. You actually see that right now. So this does require a little bit of heat. Uh, think of it as kind of putting more sugar in your Kool-Aid in order to dissolve it a little bit more. So I've got my hot plate actually sit uh, or sat on uh, about 178, 180 degrees. And uh, we're just going to kind of let this hang out in a hot jacuzzi tub for a little bit uh, until we decide to take it off when all of the malic and hydride dissolves. And at that point, we'll pick back up from the laboratory procedure. All 
Okay, so the heat is on the water at this point, and the malican hydride is quickly dissolving for me, uh, which is good because that's what I want it to do. So I want all of those crystals to be in solution before I go further in the next step of the reaction. If they're not dissolved in solution, then they're not going to be freed up for the next part of the reagents. Uh, they have to be accessible to those reagents in order to react. So I'm just going to continue to kind of let this do its thing. As you can see, the malican hydride is swimming around, very large flakes, but they are slowly dissolving for me. Okay, so at this point, uh, I've taken the malic and hydride and the water solution off of the hot plate because it started to boil, and that's exactly what the lab directions told me to do. It said, remove it when it just begins to boil. And uh, now we need to add the zinc in three to four small portions. So I'm just going to kind of tap the weigh boat a little bit, and that's it. And you can somewhat see what's happening to the zinc at this point. Uh, I don't know if I can zoom in a little bit better, but my zinc is basically starting to bubble, bubble, toil, and trouble. So I start to see a lot of generation of fumes that come off and that type of thing as well. All right, uh, so uh, I'm just gonna add very small, tiny little portions of this meshy zinc. You can see it bubble maybe, and especially here in the right hand corner. And uh, I'm just going to continue to add. Uh, the zinc sometimes have this has this coating on it uh, that has to be dissolved or has to be removed before the actual zinc can do its job. Uh, so uh, my zinc has now been added. Uh, now it tells me to place it back onto like a stir plate. Uh, I'm just going to put it back onto the hot plate that this thing was on. Uh, and it said to continuously stir it. So what I have here is just a magnet. And the magnet is just going to be dropped down onto the inside and I'll turn the stirrer onto the hot plate and that will stir the solution for me uh, throughout the next 15 minutes. So nothing too much is going to happen here as far as excitement goes. Uh, it does look like a little bit of observation that I could have made though is that the zinc did initially bubble a little bit before it went into the solution. So we're going to put it on 15 minutes, we're going to stir it, and then we'll go to the next part of the procedure, which is adding the hydrochloric acid. All right, so keep in mind what we talked about before we actually started playing these videos, the purpose of zinc, and, you know, we've not really actually added any hydrochloric acid at this point. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that I don't have any type of acid that's lingering behind in deionized water, uh, because that just means the ions are removed. Uh, but there was a little bit of bubble generation right there due to the zinc addition. Uh, but it's not quite actually the major bubbling step that we would expect as far as what we talked about before we started looking at these slides and looking at these pictures. So uh, I took the flask and I put it back onto the hot plate. And uh, what you're seeing here is just the stir bar actually spinning around in the flask. And uh, we had to kind of do this a little bit here. I, I think it probably tells me to let this kind of go uh, for 15 minutes or so before we go through with the next step. Uh, and that just means I just need to kind of let it sit and not really baby it too much. So I'm just going to turn the stir on, let it spin, let it kind of get associated with itself and uh, come back to it after a certain amount of time. Uh, the time here, I did make a note uh, and the time at this point uh, was uh, started, this stir the stirring actually started on the hot plate between the zinc and the malican hydride uh, for a, uh, it's about 15 minutes, but I really started it at 9.08 and this ended at uh, 9.32. So I actually let this go a little bit further than what it tells me in the directions, but that's not a big deal. You know, I just uh, took a little bit longer. I was distracted. I was doing something else. Uh, but whatever, right? This is going to be perfectly okay. So 908 to 932 was the actual heating time uh, that uh, I used when I did the lab. Okay. All right. So uh, now we're going to go into the next step of the lab procedure and it's adding hydrochloric. So here's the hydrochloric stock bottle and uh, it tells me how much to add directly in the lab procedure. It says five milliliters. So there's the proof. There's my five milliliter of concentrated 
HCl. Uh, concentrated is 12 molar. That is what concentrated means. So uh, concentrated acid cannot get any more concentrated. That's why it's called concentrated. So 12 pointish molar is going to be as high as we can get this. So I'd just like to round that number off to a nice even 12, even though it's a little bit more than that. All right, uh, so uh, here's the addition of hydrochloric acid. And again, I'm just going to kind of shut up and let my virtual self talk and uh, or virtual virtual self talk. And uh, I'll come back to you after the video is over. All right, so we're back to the zinc and the malican hydride that's in here. Uh, you can actually take a look, and it's very, very cloudy. Um, you know, this uh, zinc has dissolved. The malican hydride has dissolved. Not all of the zinc has actually dissolved fully, but that's part of the next step that we're going to do, and that is to add hydrochloric acid to the mix. Uh, so uh, this very cloudy looking solution I'm slowly going to add it says five milliliters of hydrochloric acid and that's what you're going to see getting dripped or added into the flask again observational changes uh, just take note of what's here it's very frothy it's very milky um, these are things that I'm going to basically see throughout this uh, experiment until all of the zinc basically gets used up uh, so a uh, little bit by little bit I'm also starting to see maybe some clearing up at this moment. So the hydrochloric acid is doing its job. It's, it's dissolving the rest of that zinc uh, that did not get dissolved in the first round. I also see some cloudiness that's happening on the flask. Uh, some condensation that's happening on the flask here. It's pretty normal. Uh, this thing is pretty hot at this moment. Uh, so all of that is kind of uh, some condensation just due to water vapor that's escaping that reaction now at this moment. All right. Uh, so one last portion of hydrochloric acid that gets added. There we go. Five mils in total using a graduated cylinder. And uh, if I take this off and just give it a swirl you actually probably see a little bit of grayish color that's in it now. And uh, once again, not all of the zinc has dissolved. You see a little bit of that on the side there. So uh, now the directions just tell me set this aside and uh, kind of let it do its thing uh, while um, we heat it. So I'm going to turn my hot plate on yet again, just like we had in the very beginning. And that hot plate will begin to give this thing the necessary heat and the catalyst in order to make this product for me. So it says when most of the zinc or a lot of it has dissolved at least, heat it to boiling under a hood. So I'm going to crank the heat on, I'm going to let it kind of do its job, and then we're going to filter that solution through a piece of filter paper. All right, so I'm just going to keep an eye on it when it begins to boil. That's when I'll take it off and I'll need to filter it to get rid of any of that remaining zinc that did not disappear for me. All right, so it's very clear that something was going on in the flask, and this is the addition of the hydrochloric acid. So the zinc is reacting with the hydrochloric acid at this moment. I'm going to start to see more and more of it dissolve over a course of time. That's creating these products from that reaction that will then target the malican hydride that we have dissolved in solution. Uh, you're starting to see some cloudiness, some color changes, and some observational changes that you can include in a laboratory report if you're required to write one. So I'll let you you make those uh, observations on your own. Uh, the next picture here is just really a close-up of the solution changing as I added the hydrochloric acid. So uh, just a little bit better picture, a close-up, uh, I guess, of what's happening inside of the flask. And then sooner or later, um, I'm going to look at the flask and I'm going to take a picture and note that not all of the zinc is actually dissolved. I mean, we do still have some that's left behind. This is not a big deal. We put extra zinc in from the very beginning just to make sure there was enough of that somewhat catalyst for this to go forward. So I'm expected not to dissolve all of this stuff, but that gives you an idea of how much zinc is going to be left over. All 
All right, so we're back at the zinc flask, and the zinc flask, you can see all of the cloudiness, the milkiness has went away. Uh, it pretty much is a clear solution at this point. It really isn't bubbling yet. That's actually just the magnet that's continuing to stir my solution. Uh, so it's not yet to, ready to be taken off of the hot plate to filter at this point. I'm still gonna let it kind of do its job for the next few minutes. Uh, and then when I really do start to see it boil, I'll take it off at that point. But right now, it's just really stirring. That's all that it's doing. So it's just making these two reagents mix together a little bit better. And uh, we're almost ready, but not quite. All right, so again, just a close-up of the flask and uh, the flask as it sits on top of the heating plate. Uh, so uh, you can see some of this zinc that's still floating around here. We're not fully boiling it yet, uh, so we're not even made it to that part of the procedure. It's just this initial reaction phase that's beginning to happen here. So uh, once more, just a close-up of what's happening uh, in the flask for you to make those observations. Okay, so we are almost at boiling, uh, not quite, but we're close. Uh, and what you're seeing in the flask is just remaining zinc that's floating around. I mean, that is not product. Uh, it's not product that we want. It's not product that we want to keep, but we've got to get rid of it. And that's the point of the next filtration step. Uh, so uh, what you're going to see over here to the side, eventually I'm going to filter that solution through just a normal filter with a piece of filter paper that I've folded and placed in the funnel, uh, and then uh, through the funnel into a new 125 mil Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, and the point of that is, of course, again, to get rid of all of this zinc that's still kind of remaining and lagging behind. It's just the idea that I could have added too much in the beginning, and we've got to get rid of it in order to go forward. I don't want that to contaminate my product. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next step. All right, so finally we get to a point where a lot of it has dissolved at this point, and this is just when it begins to boil, and that's actually what the lab directions tell me to do. It says when the zinc or most of it has dissolved, and visually you can see that's actually happened here, heat the mixture to boiling under the hood, and we are getting closer and closer to boiling. You can actually see quite a few of these bubbles that are down here in the bottom that's beginning to happen on my flask. And then it says if there's any white solid that's form during the reaction it will dissolve it's not a big problem and then the next step is now filter it so we are at this boiling stage and uh right now the time clock was about 9 48 a.m so again if you're keeping track of times uh this is going to kind of give you a time to go by so that way you can prove and justify that you did what you said that uh you were supposed to do as far as the lab directions go all right so in the next um uh, page, you're going to see a uh, another video of me getting ready to filter this very hot boiling solution uh, to get rid of any zinc that might still be remaining in that flask. And of course there is, because you can see it right there to the bottom right hand side of the flask. All right, it's time for me to filter. So I'm just gonna grab this uh, Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, it's probably gonna be better for me to uh, use a hot glove or something, but I'll do this pretty quick. Uh, and then in it goes. And I'll just uh, let this continue to drain. I want all of this liquid down below. I don't want any of the remaining zinc that stays behind in the filter paper. That's why I did not actually weigh the filter paper before I used it. It doesn't really matter. We're going to throw this away. We don't need it. It's trashy. All right, so I'm going to continue the filter, and then we'll put this back onto the hot plate, and we'll continue to boil it. All right, so again, uh, you can make your observations the way that you need to. Notice there was still some zinc that was left behind in that flask, and I am going to rinse out the remaining of that metal. But I also want to have you keep in mind that this is metal, and these are organometallics in a way that we are working with. Now, the zinc is not necessarily capturing inside of an organic molecule, and it's not really flipping carbocation nature and structure around, uh, but this is a metal that is 
is really appearing in terms of zinc uh, in an organic reaction for another purpose. Uh, so uh, here's just a, a picture beforehand, um, uh, or the video again, I guess. Um, and then here is a picture after the fact. Uh, and this um, solution notice is very cloudy here in the bottom of that flask. And this is actually what was happening as I was filtering. So as I was filtering that very hot solution through, it would hit this room temperature flask and this colder countertop here. And I started to see a little bit of crystallization that started to form on the bottom of that flask there. Uh, so uh, again, I'm just going to kind of let my virtual, virtual self talk and I'll turn me off. All right, so as you can see, the crystals dissolved back in solution. It's pretty normal, pretty typical, uh, especially because it got hotter when it was on the hot plate. So they were falling out once it went through the filter paper because the solution wasn't as hot at that point. Uh, and now on the hot plate, they just fell back in solution and that's pretty normal. So it's going to tell me to continue to heat it, uh, continue to boil it, and that's what we're doing. And it says continue to do that until it goes cloudy. That means that we're boiling off this water that you're seeing in the Erlenmeyer flask. And that water is slowly going to leave. And sooner or later, there's not going to be a lot of solvent left over. And those crystals cannot fall back in solution. And we're going to create this like super saturated solution type of environment where these crystals are going to fall out even if it's hot on a hot plate. And that's the moment where we're going to take it off and we're going to set it to a side and we're going to let it cool. So I'm going to continue to let it heat. You can see it's bubbling slightly, not vigorously. I don't really like it when that happens. Uh, so I'm just once more taking my time, making sure that all the steps are getting done the proper way. And then I'll pull this off when it goes cloudy. Okay, so the next step is just to let it continue to heat on that hot plate. Uh, we're going to evaporate a lot of this solvent off. And then sooner or later, what I'll end up with is something that looks like this. So this is the point of which the solvent, a lot of it, has now went away. It's escaped the flask and it's left all of this product baby crystal behind. And these are beautiful crystals on the outside of the floor, or the inside of the flask, up on the walls of the flask. Uh, they're very long, they're very needle-like, and uh, these are things that we often look for as far as uh, purity uh, is concerned in organic chemistry and product, especially when crystals are are uh, kind of at the focus or at the forefront. Uh, so this is the product that I'm after. Eventually, I want these crystals out of the flask and I want to purify them and I want to test them because I want to know what those are. That is not malic and hydride anymore. That is something else. And we need to figure out what that something else is. So this process took uh, a little over an hour here. Again, I went very slow and this is going to stop at 10.57 a.m. in the morning. So it heated for a little bit longer than one hour. Again, I was in no rush. I was in not hurry. I just let it kind of hang out, do its job. The Erlenmeyer flask, the way that it's tapered, actually is made to slow this process down even more. And that's fine. I was working on other things while I had my back turned on this. So uh, more than an hour later, I come back and those were the beautiful crystals that greeted me when I came over to the lap bench. All right. So uh, here's just another picture of me uh, kind of putting a um, tool down on the inside, like a rubber policeman or some kind of scupola, and just scraping the sides of the flask down. And you're starting to see this wet, clumpy precipitate. Uh, that I'm kind of gathering all in one spot. So I knew that I was going to have to filter this sooner or later, and I knew I wanted a mass of this product. So I went and got a watch glass, and I put the watch glass on the balance, and that watch glass had a mass of 51.109 gram. So uh, once I measured the watch glass, it was my job now to take these crystals and get them out of this flask and get them through a funnel and a filter paper so that way we can allow them to dry and that way I can take a mass of those at a later time and a later date.
All right. So here was the filter paper that uh, I decided to use. Uh, it's a Buckner funnel size filter paper. So 55 millimeter in diameter. It is qualitative filter paper. Uh, and uh, that piece of filter paper again was masked and it's kind of fuzzy, but it says 0 0.211 gram. All right, so at this point, I don't really have a video of me actually doing it, but I took these crystals and then um, I just added a little bit of not solvent, but solution to it that would not re-dissolve those crystals, and I poured them onto the filter paper in the Buckner funnel. And uh, this is what you're seeing here. So this is the filtered precipitate here, uh, and then all of these are the crystals that have happened on that piece of filter paper. Uh, so I just allowed this vacuum filter to run, 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 and that's going to help dry these crystals a little bit faster. Uh, however, I'm not going to do anything with them for the rest of the day. So I'm just going to leave them like this, and then I'm going to leave the lab, and I'm going to come back on day two. And on day two, I'll come back, and these are the dried crystals if you need to take observations with them. All right. So on the second day, when I came back, it was more in the afternoon and this was at 11.05 a.m. All right. So that was day two, 11.05 that morning. All right, so I took my scupola and I kind of just lifted this piece of filter paper up out of the funnel. And then I transferred all of that over to that watch glass that we uh, kind of masked out the day before. And here are the crystals and there's the filter paper. And uh, I need to kind of do a mass of it now. So uh, what I did is that I went over and I teared the actual watch glass today. That's what I did before I put that piece of filter paper on it. So when I teared the uh, watch glass, this number, of course, does not include the mass of the watch glass. So then I put the crystals and the filter paper on it, and then I took another mass, and this 3.997 represents the mass of the crystal, and the filter paper only. So the watch glass is not included. All right, so now the next lab directions tells me to actually get a capillary tube and do a melting point. Uh, so here are the capillary tubes that I picked. Notice they have a nice little rounded edge bottom on them here, and I need to load that solid substance up in those capillaries, and I need to do a melting point. So I'm going to do a melting point using our melting point system, and I'm just going to sit back and let my virtual virtual self tell you a little bit about the startup of the machine and how to load samples up on the machine. All right, so this is our melting point system. Uh, it's going to be my job to take these capillary tubes uh, that we just packed with the product from the Malik and Hydride reaction, and we need to get a melting point of this to kind of help narrow down which carboxylic acid that I possibly have. Um, this is going to be a very general analysis, and the reason that I say that is because uh, I don't really know what melting point I'm after, so I'm just going to have to do a pretty wide range. Uh, up here at the top is where I'll put the uh, capillary tubes. Bottom end is down uh, with my solid sample. Uh, it can actually hold up to four, but right now I've only loaded two. Uh, on the screen, uh, I'm now going to maybe zoom in a little bit for you so you can see this a little bit better. All right, so on the screen of the melting point system, I'm going to go into manual method. Uh, when I do that, I'm going to have to kind of give it a start time and an end uh, temperature, or a start temperature and an end temperature. So the start temperature right now is set at 78. Uh, I'm going to have to change that, though. I'm going to have to take it pretty low. Uh, I'm just going to start it at 40. Hopefully it doesn't melt before 40. If so, we've got to pack it again. Uh, and then the end temperature, this thing can go really high. I mean, I'm not sure what it's going to be. So I'm just going to keep in maybe 200 degrees and we're going to see what happens here. Uh, if it doesn't melt by 200 degrees, I'll have to redo it and I'll have to kind of crank the temperature up a little bit hotter. So it goes from 40 to 200 and then the heating rate is 10 degrees per minute. So uh, you can kind of do the math. You'll figure out how long this process is going to take uh, in order for this system to give me an automated melting point temperature. Uh, now I'm going to hit start. Uh, this is like preheating your oven 
quite honestly. Uh, it's just going to heat up to 40 degrees. Uh, right now over here, you're going to see a temperature that's going to kind of go up, 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 up. It's at 26. Now it's 27. Uh, now it's at 28. So it's going to go to 40 and it's going to beep. That way it will let me know that the oven is preheated at this moment. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of keep an eye on the uh, crystals as they begin to melt. Uh, so this is the process of the melting point system. Uh, I'll come back after it gets finished and I'll see what the melting point system tells me. All right, and I just realized that I actually skipped one of the videos, and that's me packing the capillary. So how do we actually get sample in that capillary? Well, stay tuned and you'll find out. All right, so what you're looking at is the product of the Malikin hydride reaction with the zinc. And uh, our next step after we've taken the mass of it is to do a melting point because the melting point will kind of give me an idea of a possibility of which uh, carboxylic acid that we've made in this reaction. So uh, I just kind of showed you a picture of the capillary tubes that we use uh, for this purpose. And to load those capillary tubes, this process is very easy. So the only thing that I have to do is just kind of crunch the bottom of the capillary tube into the powder or the crystal. And you can see here that there is a plug of a solid substance up into the top of the capillary. Then I have what we call a tamping tool, uh, and the tamping tool is just really a metal rod. And uh, I'm just going to push the metal rod into the capillary tube, and I'll find this very tiny plug of uh, solid in the very bottom. So uh, that's what we're after. It doesn't take a lot to do a melting point analysis. That's actually um, all that I, I need, really. It's actually more than what I need. Uh, so I'm going to do two of these, and we're going to put them in the melting point system, and we're going to calculate or uh, obtain a melting point uh, in order to give us an insight of a possibility of the product. And then we'll titrate it after that. Okay, so here's a better view of the screen on the melting point system. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to look for is basically the crystal itself and how much it's filled in the capillary tube. I don't need it all the way to the top but I need a good portion, maybe at least half full of crystal here in the bottom of the capillary tube. And they look quite packed, so I've got enough in each one. Uh, over here, it's going to tell me how long this process is going to take. Uh, it looks to me like 16 minutes. It will be finished. It will heat all the way to 200, uh, and it will go through the entire heating process. Uh, now we've preheated. It's at 40 degrees. Uh, here at the bottom, it's just going to say it's going to give me a melting point and not a melting range. Uh, and uh, it's waiting on me to kind of uh, hit start at this point. So it's preheated. It's ready. It's not actually heating at all right now, which is okay. I don't want it to. And here at the very bottom, I'm going to hit start. All right, so now the time is going to kick in. There is a 10 minute wait period before it does anything, or 10 second wait period before it does anything. Uh, and then after that time ticks down at 16 minutes, you'll start to see this temperature slowly increase and it will increase uh, 10 degrees for every minute that this machine is on. Uh, so you can see how fast maybe this process is gonna take, but because we've had to do such a large window, this total time is going to be 16 minutes. Uh, if I had a better idea of what my compound is, I shorten the window down and I don't have to wait as long. Uh, but now I just kind of let the machine take over. It will look at these crystals. It will figure out when they melt. It will give me that time stamp or that temperature stamp on the display screen. So that way I can do uh, something else with it and compare it to a table here at the very end of this process. All right, so uh, I, I, there's no sense in uh, looking at this for the next 15 minutes. I'm just gonna stop the video here and then we'll pick up after this instrument gets finished. All right, so this is just an update. Uh, notice the crystals are still solid. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, six minutes into the process now, and we're at temperature of 98 degrees Celsius. Uh, so we still have more heating to do. These crystals have not melted. Uh, I did not need to be here. Uh, the machine will kind of take over if it needs to take over. That's not a problem. But I just kind of wanted to show you midway through what's happening in the melting point system. So crystals are still there at 101 degrees. 
cookies, they still haven't melted. All right, so up on the screen, you're going to see temperature of 163, and I'm just going to hit this um, uh, video that it has recorded for us, so that way we can go back and review. And I want to watch to see when these crystals begin to melt. Uh, you're looking at this very first column here. You're seeing some movement actually at this moment, and now you see those crystals actually begin to disappear. Uh, up here at the top, that is the temperature of which that is happening. So you can rewind this portion of the video, figure out what melting temperature this has happened at. However, this is one of the reasons that we do more than one portion because if you've noticed, nothing has really happened to the second uh, capillary tube yet, right? That is still uh, pretty much a solid crystal at this point. Uh, and we are a few degrees over the temperature of which the first capillary has melted. Uh, now you're starting to see some movement in those crystals. They haven't fully melted yet those solid crystals are still present and I need to know what temperature that capillary tube is going to melt at as well. They are different, so therefore I should report both of these. Uh, you know, in normal circumstances, we would have had a third and maybe a fourth, and we would have taken an average of all four. Uh, this is typically uh, the problem with product that is not necessarily 100% dry. Uh, so you're seeing some uh, movement in those crystals again. They are melting at this point. And again, take a look at the screen and you'll figure out what temperature those are melting at right now. Uh, so uh, let's go with an average. We'll see if the average gets as close. Uh, however, if one is way closer than the other one, as far as the final results go, we know that a little bit of water or moisture could have been the problem here. Uh, and that's something that I kind of just want to make sure that uh, doesn't drag behind through product analysis, especially in the organic chemistry world. All right, uh, so there's our melting point system. And uh, now we're off to the final part of the laboratory, which is titration. All right, so I just want to make myself clear here as far as the uh, water issue went and why there was such a wide range of the two different melting points. Um, the, the first thing that we always see in a laboratory is that when I do mass of a solid product from a reaction, very often if I don't give it enough time to actually dry, which means leave it overnight, come back in the next day, leave it for two days, leave it to three days, or put it in the oven and just leave it in there until we drive all of the water off, then water can actually be kept behind. So when I do my percent uh, yield, if my percent yield, of course, is very high, or if my percent yield is greater than 100%, then I know that water is going to be the culprit. That's really one of the major violators of having an organic product that is 90, 100, 110, 120% as far as yield goes. So with that said, water has a melting point here or a boiling point of 100. So if water is mixed in with your product, then that uh, particular boiling point is actually going to be mixed in with the product that you have created, and it will do funny things to your melting point of your solid products that you're getting from these reactions. And it really just depends on if those products are extremely higher than 100 or lower than 100. So for instance, if this melting point should be higher than 100, way higher, then this water is going to cause an issue because the water is actually going to start causing this melting point to get closer to a average between water and the actual product. So Depending on which our product is, that's how water is going to play a hand or a role in this whole situation. So use percent yield first to go by. And then once we do percent yield, uh, we'll have a better understanding if water is possibly a culprit. And if so, then I probably don't want to choose the lower melting point here because the lower melting point would have been the one closer to the 100 and the higher melting point was not. Why do we get Get two different ones. Well, one could have been taken from an area of the product that was a little more damp, 
And the other one could have been taken from a area that was a little bit drier, depending on how much crystal was actually in those locations. All right. All right, so uh, our uh, one of our last steps, uh, not quite last step, but one of our last steps is this sample for titration. So uh, the lab directions are going to tell me to weigh out a certain amount of product and dissolve that into some water and titrate it. So here is the sample of product that I've weighed out. It's 0 0.123 grams of that malic and hydride product that was on the weigh boat and the piece of filter paper, and I set up a titration. So the titration, I know, I know. Oh, this is Jen Kim. Uh, the titration is a burette that you're seeing here. And then this is a burette clamp that is just holding the burette on the ring stand. Uh, down here at the bottom is the malic and hydride portion that I've just weighed out that's been dissolved in a little bit of water. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have to add some indicator in this as well for the color change to happen. Uh, so that is the typical setup of a titration. These are always the ingredients that you need in order for, for this thing to actually work. Uh, the burette is actually filled with a solution called Called a titrant, and uh, the titrant is a known concentration of substance that we have. So a known concentration of that titrant is going to be present. All right, so I'm going to fill that burette up to the top, and then I've got my portion of malic and hydride that's down here to the bottom, and then I'm going to start a titration up. All right, so let's kind of take a look at this titration setup. All right, so you probably never thought you would see titration in organic chemistry, but guess what? You do, and it's right here. Uh, so uh, here in the bottom is the sample of the product that we have made with the malic and hydride um, reaction. And then up on top is just a burette, a typical burette that you see here uh, that is 50 mils uh, in uh, volume. So we're going to slowly add that titrant to the Erlenmeyer flask that has the product, and we're going to be looking for a traditional pink color change. Uh, so that's what we're doing next, and that is the titration. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer, and you can see that color change happen a little bit better. All right, so here is the uh, burette with the starting amount of titrant of sodium hydroxide in it. Uh, so you can take that down as your initial volume amount. I need to add indicator into that solution as well. And the indicator that we're going to use here is phenophthalene. And phenophthalene indicator is normally colorless in acidic conditions. And then it goes pink in basic conditions. So we have a carboxylic acid. And a carboxylic acid is a C double bond OOH. And it's called carboxylic acid for a reason. And that's because it's an acid. And because it's an acid, Acid, this thing will be clear colorless, hopefully, when we add the phenophthalene in it. So when all of the acid is basically killed out by the sodium hydroxide base that we're going to be adding to it, that is when we get the traditional pink color that phenophthalene makes for us. So this is all the properties of a normal acid base titration here. That is what we are doing. So there's the phenophthalene indicator, and it just really needs a couple of drops and that's it. All right, so we're getting ready to titrate, and uh, I'm going to add a few drops of phenophthalene indicator in here. Uh, it doesn't take very much, probably three to four is what I've just added. And uh, phenophthalene under acidic conditions is clear colorless. Uh, so that's why you're not seeing a color change happening into the flask below. And then when sodium hydroxide hits it, it's going to go pink and basic solution. So in the very beginning, you might see a little bit of pink that shows up as far as the solution goes, but that will quickly fade because not enough base is actually in there to get it to turn color. So I've opened the stopcock 
on the uh, burette and I'm going to add sodium hydroxide into my solution until I get that traditional pink color phenophthalene. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to kind of keep adding and we're going to see when my pink stays behind a little bit longer uh, and then a little bit longer and then a little bit longer and then sooner or later a pink will form and it will stay and that is where I stop the titration. All right, so here's the close-up of the uh, titration, uh, just so that you can see what's happening inside of the Erlenmeyer flask a little bit better. Uh, so I'm going to open up the stopcock, and you can see the very bright flashes of pink that's beginning to happen with every drop of sodium hydroxide uh, that we add into that flask. So sooner or later, that pink will actually stay and uh, that's the point that I stopped the titration. So I'm just going to kind of let this continue to do what it needs to do and I'm going to shut up for a change and just kind of let you watch when this color uh, change actually happens and that's when we'll stop it. That's kind of creepy, isn't it? Me not saying anything at all. All right, so as you can tell, the pink color is getting more vibrant. Uh, you see it a little bit more with every drop that's getting added to the flask. Uh, and that's pretty normal, very typical, traditional phenophthalene. We're getting closer and closer to the end point of the titration. All right, so our burette looks like we're at 11.5 mils and we're gonna to continue to add. All right, we're approaching 13 milliliters and the uh, solution still has not went to that traditional phenophthalene pink. So that means we are still in acidic environment. We are not basic yet. So there's still acid that's left over in that flask that we want to neutralize out. Notice the solution's getting a little cloudy. It's not as clear as what it used to be, but it's still not turned color. All right, so we're at 14 milliliters and we'll continue to add. All right, and there's that traditional pink color that you're after. So very faint baby color pink, 
and I don't want to go any further. So this looks like it's happening about 16 milliliters. All right, so part of the requirement of a titration is to get this uh, very faint pink color and to have it actually stay for at least 20 to 30 seconds. And I just kind of wanted to pause the video, come back to it, uh, show you that this basically is what happened. Uh, so we are after the equivalence point at this moment uh, and we feel really good about killing out all of that acid that was inside of that sample that we previously measured out on the balance. All right, so uh, that is that traditional, again, faint pink color. If I added more sodium hydroxide, this is the color that it will go, and that is a bad color. Sure, it looks pretty, it looks very vibrant, it is like a fuchsia and a hot pink, but folks, that is exactly not what we want with phenophthalene. That means there's way too much base in here now, and that way too much base is going to give us a wrong volume, which gives us wrong calculations. So I don't want to use the volume when it goes this bright pink or fuchsia pink. I need the baby pink color, and that's really what we strive for when we use phenophthalene. All right, so uh, we are now kind of finished with the lab procedure. Just really have to do the cleanup at this moment. Uh, we've titrated it. We've done a melting point, and a little bit of calculation would allow us to go in and figure out which of those carboxylic acids uh, that we have made at this moment. All right, so as far as the titration goes, uh, here was the uh, volume on the burette when that very baby, faint pink color uh, began to appear, and this is where we stopped it. So you can use this kind of guideline to go by to report the volume that you think that it took in order for the titration to take place. Uh, I also misspoke because there's actually one more test that we need to do, and that one more test is going to concern an FTIR instrument, right? So we've done a melting point on the product. Now we've titrated the product because we know that it's an acid and we can get a little bit of data uh, concerning that acid product through the titration that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, but there's one more, one more. And if this is a carboxylic acid, then we should be able to use an FTIR to prove that a carboxylic acid actually uh, formed and was generated from the reaction. All right, so we're going to do an infrared on this substance, and the reason is because you know what infrared is at this moment, and we're thinking that this is a carboxylic acid, and you know where carboxylic acids show up on infrared spectrum. At least I hope you do. So I've just double-clicked the software on the computer screen. Uh, it is called Lab Solutions. It, this is, our, again, our Shimatsu system that we have in the laboratory. Uh, this prompt is going to pop up. Uh, we don't really have username and passwords for this, so we're just going to bypass that. Uh, once more, just like in the infrared lab, I'm going to go into spectrum because I want to obtain a spectrum. I don't need any of the other icons that are on the screen, and I'm going to wait for this uh, software to initialize and start up. I've already flipped the power button on uh, to the infrared, uh, and that power button is here to the right-hand corner of the uh, instrument, and uh, it's now on. It's ready to go. So uh, when this software starts up, and uh, we're almost there, uh, we're going to initialize and um, the machine get it registered with the software so that way we can actually do something with it. Uh, on the computer screen, I'm going to go to instrument and just initialize here. Uh, it's going to ask me to get rid of a background, which is tearing the machine out, just like tearing a balance out from the previous run or the previous user. All right, so uh, this is the FTIR that we're getting ready to use, and uh, we're going to be using the ATR attachment uh, in order to put my product on.
All right, so here's a close-up of our FTIR instrument. Uh, I'm just going to open up the uh, main door of the FTIR. And uh, normally we would put our sample cells, which are salt plates and that type of thing, on the inside. Uh, however, we have our nice, fancy uh, ATR attachment here. So I'm going to put it in the machine. Uh, it just sits down in there, cradles very nicely. And uh, the screw in the front is just so that we can secure the... Um, ATR on the inside uh, and that's really all that I have to do uh, in order to get this thing prepped I'm going to move what we call the anchor out of the way I don't really need that right now uh, that just helps press the sample against the um, small area of the diamond uh, or the crystal that's in the middle of that ATR attachment. All right, so now that that is prepped, I'm gonna to have to tear out the machine uh, and to do that I need to do a background scan All right, so what you see on the computer screen right now is just the main piece of the software. Uh, and uh, I need to do a background scan. So up here in the top uh, left-hand corner, I see BKG scan. I'm going to press that button. And it says prepare the sample compartment for the background scan. Uh, that's what I have done uh, now at this point. So I'm going to hit OK. That just basically means put the ATR on the inside. Uh, and it's going to give me what we call the background at this point. Uh, so the uh, background is just all of the infrared radiation that's getting absorbed uh, by the environment or by the ATR plate um, or things that just can't be a traditional zero for transmittance in the infrared field. Uh, so it's going to do this uh, 45 times. It's going to do an average uh, and then when it gets ready, it will actually tell me in the top left-hand side of the computer screen. Those buttons go green again. Uh, right now they are grayed out, which means that the background scan is still kind of doing its job. Uh, so when those three green buttons reappear on the top left, I'll go and load my sample up onto the instrument. And there we go. So top left, those three green buttons again show up. Background scan is the first one, and the middle one is called sample scan. Uh, so now I'll load up some of my solid crystal on the ATR plate, and I will sample scan it at this point. All right, so uh, here's a close-up of the FTIR. Uh, this piece here is my ATR attachment, uh, and that's just going to help me uh, load this sample up a little bit faster. I don't have to use salt plates. I don't have to use moles. I don't have to do any of that sample processing or loading. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the ATR attachment so that way you can see this in real time. Uh, so there's the ATR diamond crystal in the center and the only thing that I need is just put a little bit of sample onto the surface of that crystal. It doesn't take a lot, uh, just a few crystals and uh, that will be plenty enough. All right, so I'm just gonna kinda scoot them here to the side uh, or to the center, sorry, and uh, now that those are loaded up, uh, what I can do at this point is swing this arm around and I'll lower this anchor down. Uh, and by doing that, it helps press those crystals against the crystal so that way I'll get a better infrared at this point. So that's the purpose of what we call the anchor. And now I'm going to go back to our computer screen and I'm going to take a look at the uh, infrared that begins to show up. All right, here's our computer screen. Now my sample is loaded. I'm gonna go over to sample scan, which is the button in the middle, and I'm going to press it. And hopefully I'll get an infrared that will begin to appear on the uh, computer screen. Uh, and I do. So what I'm looking for here is a traditional, uh, you know, carboxylic acid type of product. Uh, and right now this is not the actual infrared that you're seeing on the computer screen. Uh, what you're seeing is just the uh, signals 
that's being generated by the software and it's not really necessarily ratioed itself out yet. Uh, so uh, I'll just let the computer screen do what it needs to do and then once it gets finished it will come back and it will tell me uh, this is the infrared that we have obtained. But this is not it yet folks. This is just what we would call a raw signal uh, and not the proper infrared spectrum. Okay, so my infrared spectrum has appeared. Uh, again, uh, we think that we've made a carboxylic acid, so I hope that the uh, typical signs of a carboxylic acid is present. Uh, keep in mind that in the infrared field, what we discussed was carboxylic acids have a carbonyl, of course, and they also have that traditional kind of OH dip uh, because a carboxylic acid is a C double bond OOH. Uh, so this is the report that you're going to see. Uh, we can get the software to go in and name the actual uh, infrared spectrum that it has obtained. Uh, and uh, to do that, uh, up in the top toolbar, you might not be able to see that, but I have a search feature, and that searches the database uh, that we have with Shimatsu, and it will tell me exactly what this infrared is. It will say, this is the compound, and we hope that one of those compounds is a carboxylic acid, and we hope that one of those compounds is the expected product from the reaction that we did. However, I'm not going to go through that. Uh, I'm just going to print this report off, and you're going to have to circle areas that you think represent a carboxylic acid if it's even present so uh, just keep in mind these things can shift they can take slightly different shapes but the traditional heart of a carboxylic acid should be there so uh, that's where we're going to kind of stop the lab at this point as far as the testing of the product uh, and this uh, report will be uploaded for a PDF so that way you can uh, see the infrared mark on it circle it do what you need to do with it uh, and then attach it to your lab report Folks, I also just want to say that up here on the uh, top right-hand side of the graph, you'll see benzocaine product 14. That is not actual benzocaine that I ran. I just didn't really change the name from the previous run. Someone that ran it before me ran a sample of benzocaine, and this was the name that they used on their sample report, and I actually just forgot to go in and change the name that they used. So the system actually just slaps a 14 on the back instead of a 13, and this is the reason that that name shows up in the top right hand side. So don't pay any attention to this. This is not benzocaine. This is just simply our product that we ran and I forgot to change the name on the software before I hit sample scan. Okay, so I want you to go back and replay those videos and watch them all over again and take a shot of your favorite beverage every time I say, um, 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 um. And I think that you'll have a really good time watching those videos if you do that. So I don't want to take anything for granted. We're at the end of the video, but I know that some of you are struggling with uh, theory yields, and this is something that should have been taken care of in general chemistry. But I am seeing a lot of emails from your end basically stating that you just simply don't know how to do them. And you're owning up to those mistakes, and that's perfectly fine. But I don't want to take that for granted, and I want to kind of lay out this proper procedure so that way you can calculate these and not take the massive point loss that you have been taking in the previous labs. So in the laboratory directions, you are probably going to see something about calculating the percent yield, which means that you also need to be able to calculate the theory yield of the product. So in order to do this in a general chemistry course, as well as an organic chemistry course, as well as any other laboratory course, what you need to do is to take your starting amount of reagent. And this is the number of grams of malic and hydride that we have used and place it over one. Okay. Then from this part, we're going to set up a dimensional analysis problem. Grams of malic and hydride on top, grams of malic and hydride go on the bottom, and we need to go into mole. And the reason is because mole is a common language that all of the reagents and compounds actually speak with each other with. So we can't do it in grams. we got to do it in moles every time. Mole is the quantity for amount. 
So if I look in the laboratory directions, I'm going to see the formula weight for malic and hydride. This is how we get gram and mole and that relationship together. Because the formula weight says that the molecular weight for malic and hydride is 98.1 grams per one mole. That is what that unit represents. So I don't really want to know information about malic and hydride. I want to know information about the product that I'm making. So here is mole on top and mole needs to go on the bottom in the next step of the dimensional analysis. And it's moles of something. Well, this was gram of malic and hydride. And this is gram of malic and hydride for mole of malic and hydride. So therefore, mole of malic and hydride needs to go down here. Well, what do you want? We want product. And we know that product is a carboxylic acid. So I need to go to mole of this carboxylic acid compound. I don't really know what it is yet. I don't know what it is. But I will be able to determine that after we start looking at our lab data. So in this particular reaction, this is a one-to-one -one mole ratio here which means that it takes one molecule of malic and hydride to make one molecule of the carboxylic acid product that I ended up with. There's nothing fancy that goes on with what we would call the stoichiometry of the equation. It is a one-to-one -one relationship. If I know the amount of reagent that I'm starting with, then if I can convert that into mole, that is the mole of product that I end up with. It's as simple as that. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, in the next and final step, this is a mole of carboxylic acid, and I want mole of carboxylic acid on the bottom, and I need grams of carboxylic acid, because I need to compare those grams, theory-wise, to the gram that we obtained in the laboratory. The problem is that I don't exactly know what to use here. It just is an unknown carboxylic acid. That's the title of the lab. So I'm going to have to figure the identity out first. And then when I get the identity, this is the formula weight. The formula weight of that carboxylic acid will go here over one mole. And I solve this equation. I take the grams of malic and hydride. I divide by 98.1. And then I multiply by the formula weight of the carboxylic acid that we have made, whatever that value is going to be. That will give me theory yield. To calculate percent yield, I'm going to take the theory that I should have ended up with and I'm going to subtract the actual amount that we obtained in the laboratory when we did it. Go back, watch those videos, look at your notes, see how much we ended up with. And then I'm going to divide that by the theory because that's how much we should have ended up with. So this is the difference Divide it by what it should have been. And because it's percent, we need to multiply by 100. So that will give me a percent error. And then to get percent yield, I take 100 minus the percent error. And that will give me a percent yield number here. Okay, so for instance, when I do the error calculation, it tells me how bad I am. And if I do the error calculation, if this is a 3% error, then that means my yield is probably going to be 97%. It's, is the cup half full or is the cup half empty? On a side note, I could also calculate percent yield directly just by taking what we actually ended up with, dividing it by the theory of what we should have had, and then multiply by 100. Either one of these routes are okay. It just really depends on what we're asking for at that appropriate time. So percent yield and percent error are related. And that's the reason that I did both of those versions up there in the previous example. All right, so that's the first step. Second step, what do we do with all this lab data? All right, so in the lab packet, you're going to find a table that looks like this. These are carboxylic acids up here at the very top. These are all the possibilities of carboxylic acids that could have been made from that reaction, and it's up to you to figure out what it is. So if you look at the columns, you're going to see boiling points are here, and then melting points are here, 
And then all of these like weird variant versions are going to be located in column, you know, three, four, five, and six. We don't need to do anything with these at all. So what I need to do with this chart is I need to look at melting point column. There's my melting point. And we know what those melting points are supposed to be. Remember, I said, don't necessarily go by the low one. If I was going to put trust, I would put trust in the highest one, not the lowest one, because of water contamination possibility. So if I scroll down the list of possibilities, we know that that melting point was like way over 100 and some. Go back and take a look at it. See what you get. And then see if there's a melting point on this list that matches pretty well with what we obtained in the laboratory. Now, it's going to be off. It's not going to be textbook perfect, but it will give you at least some options here. It might not really hone in on just one, but keep your kind of um, uh, options, your choices open to two or three possibilities that we have here. But this will give you an idea of how to narrow down the list. That is what we're doing. All right, we're going to narrow down the list. All right, the next step was the titration. And you need to know some information about the titration here. So the concentration of the NaOH that we used in the experiment was 0 0.1261 molarity. That was NaOH concentration. And then we're going to have to do the volume of titrant that it took in order to get that color change to happen. So I think that you can get that from your notes or from the video as well. So what do we do with these numbers? You know, why did we titrate it in the first place? Well, here's the kicker. Molarity is equal to moles per liter. And I know the concentration of the NaOH that was used in the burette. That was 0.1261. And I know the volume amount from the titration. That number is actually going to go there in that equation. The problem, though, is that this is in liter. So that means in the titration, let's say that we ended up with 10.5 mils. We didn't, but let's say that we did. I need to convert that into liter to get it into that equation to use it. So I'm going to divide by 1,000 in order to do that. There's 1,000 milliliters in a liter, folks. So I divide by 1,000. So that value is going to go here in the bottom part of that equation, and I'm going to solve for moles of NaOH, all right? And I will have that value based on that calculation. That is in reference to how much sodium hydroxide it took to basically react with the carboxylic acid that was in the bottom. Now, the reason that we do this is because this also is a one-to-one -one mole ratio. For every molecule of NaOH, it will react with a molecule of this particular carboxylic acid. But I almost made a mistake because, folks, guess what? We don't really know that for sure, right? A lot of times it is. One-to-one -one mole ratios, we see them very, very often. But the problem here is that I cannot really relate that sodium hydroxide to a unknown carboxylic acid that we have in that flask. And that is going to cause a problem. So I can't give you information on stoichiometry at this point. If I did, I'm lying to you because I don't know that. You don't know that. We don't know that until we figure out what we actually made. And until we do, we cannot make these types of conclusions. So what we do instead of this mole ratio stoichiometry and that type of number is that I'm just going to reference this to a one-to-one -one mole ratio in terms of hydrogen. What that means is that if this carboxylic acid only had one COOH group on it, it's probably just going to spit off one hydrogen and that is it, right? However, if this has two carboxylic acids on it, and we said that is a possibility for sure. I mean, we clearly saw that actually kind of take place almost. Then this is going to pump and pump out the hydrogens, and we're going to get two of them, not one. So the safest way here is to relate the moles of sodium hydroxide just to straight up hydrogen 
because I don't know anything about the compound. I don't know anything about the molecule at all. That's the purpose of the lab. So however many moles that I have from up here is actually the same number of moles of hydrogen that I'm going to get from that carboxylic acid compound that's swimming around in that Erlenmeyer flask at the bottom of my burette. These numbers are going to be equal. Every one molecule of NaOH will react with one molecule of just H+, if you want to call it a molecule. That is a one-to-one. -one. So our final step here, because we don't know structure, is to talk about something called equivalent weight. And equivalent weight is an idea that we are basing everything on hydrogen content, not actually molecule content. Because once more, I don't know what that molecule is that we made. So this equivalent weight, let me kind of show you how this works. What you end up doing is that you have all the pieces that you need to calculate equivalent weight here. You're going to take the mass of the acid that you measured out in the Erlenmeyer flask, and you're going to do that in grams. Mass is in gram here. And you're going to divide it by moles of H plus that was from that acid. And now we've set up a ratio. We've set up a ratio that basically says, if this is how much acid we have, this is how many moles that we have ended up with of H plus in the flask. If this is a one-to-one -one carboxylic acid, one C double bond OOH group, then that one molecule gives us one mole of H+. That equivalent weight is the equivalent weight, which is the formula weight of the molecule. However, if this is a two carboxylic acid structure, then there's two hydrogens here for every one molecule. So if I take the mass of the acid, I would actually get almost double the amount of hydrogen here than what was expected because it's not a one-to-one. -one. I'm getting two H's for every one molecule of carboxylic acid that's in there swimming around having some fun. So this equivalent weight will be a starting point. When I calculate this value, whatever value this is, pretend like it's formula weight. Then go back to this chart and look at the possible carboxylic acids that's on the chart and see if that ratio matches any of the formula weights that you have honed in on as a possibility. What if they don't? What if it doesn't match at all? Well, it could be two moles of H plus for every one molecule. So whatever this value is, times it by two. Look at that value. Look at that number. See what that value is and see if that matches any of these pretty closely. Again, you'll need formula weights for these possibilities. And if you multiply that number from this calculation by two and you get something pretty darn close, then that's the formula weight of the compound that you titrated. And now you have the identification of the compound. If that doesn't work, then folks, times it by three. If that doesn't work, times it by four. You keep doing it until you find something as far as that value goes that matches pretty closely with a possibility on this chart. Once you do that, you have almost determined the formula weight of the molecule. You now have the melting point of the molecule. You feel really good about the identification of the molecule. And then you can go back and calculate the theory yield at that point. Because in the very last step, it says you've got moles of that carboxylic acid compound and you want to know grams of the carboxylic acid compound. So in one mole of that carboxylic acid, you need the formula weight of the carboxylic acid that you've chosen. So once you do the melting point, it narrows down the list. 
once you do the equivalent weight calculation, it will tell you which one of those probably is going to match the best, and that will be your identifier. Then look at the actual formula weight of that compound. That is the value that goes into that dimensional analysis, and that way you can calculate the theory amount in gram of the carboxylic acid product that you have ended up with. All right, so there's a little bit of work on your part as far as the results go here. There's three different things that are happening. Now, finally, it's going to ask you to take a look at the carboxylic acid, hopefully infrared that you see on that chart. And it's going to say circle the areas that prove that you made a carboxylic acid. So you need to go back. And you need to take a look if you don't have them memorized already. If we did make a carboxylic acid here, how do you know that on infrared? And you need to take that report and you need to circle the areas on that report that prove that a carboxylic acid is present and attach that to your results. So a lot of things are happening here for the product. And this is a typical laboratory, folks. We're looking at melting point. We're looking at titration data in order to get a possible formula weight of a compound. We take that two pieces of information, we take that set of data, and we pick out what carboxylic acid is appropriate from the list that matches the data best. And then we have an infrared that does in fact hopefully show that we have generated a carboxylic acid here. Okay? All right, so good luck with the calculations. Good luck with the results. This will probably be a traditional laboratory write-up on your part. So it's all about writing down observations, writing down times, writing down important things that you will find on the grade sheet, making sure that backgrounds and procedures and everything are appropriate, and then turning that lab packet in. So have fun with it. I'm tired of talking. You're tired of writing things down. And uh, hopefully you'll get a pretty good grade on this stuff. Look, all the work's done for you. I did all the work. The only thing you got to be is almost like a secretary and write it all down. So good luck. If you've got questions, let me know.